I want to get straight to my guest, Janet Boynes. Janet's got a, a powerful book that will be coming out soon. I wrote the forward to that, and I, I want her to share that with you briefly. But she comes from a, a very broken home, uh, suffered abuse growing up, uh, ended up in lesbian lifestyle, by which I mean in lesbian relationships, also drugs and bound for 14 years. Jesus wonderfully delivered her, and she's got a great ministry to the hurting, to the broken, and to others who want to grow in God. You can find out more by going to JanetBoynesMinistries.com. That's B-O-Y-N-E-S, JanetBoynesMinistry.com. And Janet and I, off the air, have discussed the current racial tensions in America and the different perspectives through which different people see the world. So I wanted to bring her on to discuss these things with us. Uh, Janet, welcome to the Line of Fire. Thanks for joining us today. Dr. Brown, it's an honor to be a part of anything that you're doing. You have become a mentor and a friend, and I'm so grateful to to be a part of whatever you're doing. So thank you for having me. Well, my, my joy to have you. Before we get into the race issues and your perspective, uh, tell us the title of your new book. And, and uh, again, I wrote the forward to it. I'm quite familiar with the contents. But uh, tell us about your new book, when it's going to be coming out, and why you wrote it. You know, Harrison Publishing is going to publish this book, and it's coming out. Actually, the first 100 copies is going to be um, arriving at my conference that's going to be in New Jersey in August. But the release date, I'm not sure. But it's a quest for truth. And the reason why we decided to do this book is so many families and parents have contacted my ministry and said, when are you going to do something for parents? So we want to answer the tough question. My kid is decided to have a civil union. Do I go or do I not go? My child is becoming transgender. How do we respond as parents? We want to answer some of these real crucial questions that's going to help a parent not reject their child, but at the same time, love them. I believe in compassion without compromise. Let's have compassion with those who are going through difficult times, but let's not compromise the gospel. So I'm really excited to get this book out and get it into parents' hands, and a lot of people are asking us about this book. So it's going to be exciting to get it out. I think it's really going to do some help for parents and to help them have a better understanding of how to work with their child and the reason why they could be going through what they're dealing with today. And, you know, Janet, the thing that struck me most in the book, and I mentioned it in the foreword, the way you grew up, such a, a broken home, an abusive background, both from your, your mother and from a stepfather, and then living in the world, being caught up in sinful relationships for years, being on drugs, and now knowing the Lord and walking with the Lord these years since, I was struck by the degree of, of wisdom that you had as, as if you had been raised in the Lord in a godly home all the, the days of your life, as if uh, you had been in a solid marriage for decades, as if you had raised your own kids and so on. And I thought... Obviously, God's really done something deep in your life, and you've been around some great godly examples, because with the upbringing you had to be able to write a book like this, it's, it's really a testimony to God's transforming power. You know, God works from the inside out. You know, being raised in a family of seven kids, four different fathers, watching my mother get abused by my, my stepfather, my mother abused us, and I became the abuser. I was raped by my mother's husband and then by an altar boy. But what was my demise is now my voice. I wasn't going to allow my past to predict my future. However, me coming from, from point A to Z was a process. Yes, I was raped. Yes, I went into homosexuality. I struggled with drugs. I put myself in treatment. I got away from all that, and that's because of the power of God and the body of Christ and the church. It was the church that helped me to get to where I'm at today. The church is the change agent on the earth today that is going to be there to assist and help men and women come out of what they're dealing with. It's going to take all of us to be a part of that change agent. And if it wasn't for the, the church that I was at in Maple Grove, Minnesota, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I moved in with a Christian family at the age of 40. I get, walked away from that lifestyle, and this family took me in, and that's where I was able to have a better understanding of what it was like to have a family. And you know what? It wasn't a black family. 
it was a white family that took me in. But it all started back when my mm. eighth grade English teacher took me under her wing. When teachers told her, why are you going to work with a girl that gets D's and F's? She's going to wind up dead at the age of 21. But my eighth grade English teacher said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to take this girl under my wing because I see potential. And she spent time with me, working with me on my English and my writing. And I am to, what I am today is because somebody took interest in me. Somebody believed in me. Even though I went through a lot of pain because of watching my mom get abused, and then I was abused and raped, I was determined once I gave my heart to the Lord not to look back but look at what was in front of me. And all the Christian mentors that came into my life, I took everything that they said with heart. And I wasn't going to let what my past looked like or how people were trying to label me to stick with me. I knew I could do better. And I kept going at it, and I kept going at it, and I didn't give up. And now today I get an opportunity to speak around the country and share what God has done in my life. That's pretty powerful. And I, that's why I wanted to come on your show today, because I realize we're in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle. But a lot of these young kids that are getting involved in some of these fights, they're not bad kids. A lot of people thought I was a bad kid because I got kicked out of school all the time. Bad things happened to them. And so we're acting out of our pain. A lot of times we have to be rehabilitated. A lot of people look at us as second-class citizens. I know I'm black, but 98% of my friends are white, and we can go into a restaurant and they can even tell I get treated differently than they do. Mm. So racism is still here. But let me tell you what I really think is important. What was hidden in the dark is now in the light. I remember Dr. Brown when I was living a homosexual life. We were standing on a corner, and I have the utmost respect for police officers. I have friends that are police officers. But I have a healthy fear of them, too, because I know what they're capable of doing if they're in a bad mood. I was thrown up against a cop car, and I bounced off of it and, and chipped my tooth because I was standing on a corner because maybe they were having a bad day. But again, not all police officers are bad. But our young kids are getting shot. They're getting killed. And matter of fact, I'm trembling because I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. But I shouldn't have to be afraid of how I feel. These are my feelings, and they are legitimate. And what we're going to have to do is come together as a body of Christ, white, black, Hispanic, we're all going to have to sit at a table and talk about what we can do to continue to help these generations that are coming behind us. Because I'm going to tell you, this world is in a mess, and we're in a spiritual battle. And I believe that we're in a warfare against good and evil, light and dark. But what do we do, church? We fight back. We don't have to fight back with guns. We don't have to fight back with our fists. But we can fight back in the spiritual realm where the supernatural is going to bring birth to the natural. We're going to have to get on our knees and pray. We're going to have to pray for our city. We're going to have to pray for our kids. But oftentimes, we're so quick to judge these kids or these adults on how they dress or how they look or what they're doing. And we're so big on behavior modification. But I'm going to tell you what they need is the soul transformation. And the behavior will take care of itself. Mm. Yeah, Janet, uh, again, when, when we discussed you coming on the air, it was so that you could bring this perspective, which we've also heard from, from a good number of, of listeners. I've had a good number of black listeners, totally respectful of the program, in fact, enjoying the program, honoring me, God-fearing uh, citizens, uh, hardworking men, women, younger people, and they've talked to me uh, about what they faced and that's helped to round out my perspective because I didn't grow up in, in, in this way. Uh, I didn't grow up being racially profiled. I didn't grow up, uh, you know, like I, I, when I was on drugs and I was carrying drugs, I had a certain fear of the police, but that was quite justified because I was, I was breaking the law. But it wasn't because of the color of my skin. And the thing is, though, you're not saying this to attack or accuse. You're saying this to say that we have the answer, but we need to understand the depth of the issue. So when we come back, Janet... I, I want to talk about what we can do together as the body of Christ 
to address the challenges of families in the inner city, to address the challenges faced by black Americans, and again, working together as the body of Christ, and then to just give you, okay, well, here's a perspective where whites react about Black Lives Matter because what they feel is an exaggeration or dangerous rhetoric or something. So we'll we'll continue this conversation. All we can do is get started today. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for joining us on the line of fire. Your voice of moral sanity and spiritual clarity in the midst of a society in compromise in a church, excuse me, a society in chaos in a church all too often in compromise. I'm joined by Janet Boynes. Her new book will be out shortly, Quest for Truth, that will greatly help parents, leaders dealing with questions about homosexuality and transgenderism, compassion without compromise, the way Janet puts it. And I wrote the foreword to that book. Janet's last name spelled Boynes, B-O-Y-N-E-S. Janet, I'm going to throw out a couple things for you, and then you can respond at length. I'll because you've got a lot to say, and, and it's important that we hear this. And everything you're saying is redemptive and constructive, which is, again, a key why we want to hear it. So to give you a, a white perspective, which is not going to be news to you, but your average white Christian is not aware of of systemic racism in America. They're, they're thinking, hey, we're one body, we're one family in the church, and we've got, we've got a black president, and, you know, what's the big deal? And then they'll say, okay, say that the, the black man that was shot in Alabama, Alton Sterling, they'll say, look, the guy has an arrest record. He's got 20 arrests. He's a registered sex offender. He, he illegal possession, resisted arrest in the past. You know, don't make the guy into a saint. And, and now look at the, the shooting of the policeman. And this is, you know, spurred on by Black Lives Matter rhetoric and these, you know, the, the, African-American communities is being used by people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and, and you know, uh, it's divisive and, and there are bigger problems to address and things like that. So that that's how many white Americans would see things and be quite oblivious to what black Americans have experienced as a people over the years. So just give me your honest response. When you hear those things, which have validity on the one hand, but then are missing other points, First, what's your perspective? And then second, what do we do together as the church to try to bring help to a difficult situation? In my personal opinion, all African-American people aren't good people, just like white people. The one thing people got to realize, we're not second-class citizens. We're not in slavery anymore. Mm-hmm. And any white person cannot ever say to me they understand what it's like being black. Because we were the ones that were in slavery, and it feels like sometimes they're trying to keep us there. However, Jesse Jackson, L. Sharpton, only time you see them is when something happens. I don't see them out there doing anything else. They're just getting political gains. They're just like the media, always looking for a way to get their name out so they can feel like they're the big dog. They are ridiculous. They're not listening to the kids. They're not listening to those who are out there speaking. When we sit down and listen to what these kids are saying to us, I believe we're going to start making change, not based on our desires and our thoughts and what we think is best for them. They will tell you what they need. That's why Donald Trump or that's why Jeb Bush, who I like, or Cruz, that's why they're probably not the front runners. Is because you get there and we put these folks in office and they don't listen to the people. So now everybody's sick and tired of it, and now they want change. And because people are making changes, now they're telling people they're stupid and they don't make sense. No, they're doing what they think is going to be right for them and their families. And when you're pinned up against the wall and when you can't take it no more, there's a backlash. doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right to go kill anybody. We have to find another solution for when people are in pain. And I believe that inside of that pain, they're sort of acting out. And that's what's happening with most people. They're acting out. Does it make it right that they kill these police officers? No. What the police officers are doing, I believe there's so many bad cops out there. And I believe there's bad. But what the cops are going to have to do is start telling on their own. And from what I know from friends that are police officers, says if you tell on your own, that's like 
really killing somebody, one of your brothers or one of your sisters, they're going to have to start standing up and saying, no more. No more venom here in the police department. We're going to start calling you guys out, and you need to get off the force because you're making things bad for us. That's the first thing. That's where change is going to have to start in their own houses. Parents, you have to understand, African Americans, I was born out of wedlock. Many of us don't have fathers. Some of us don't even have mothers. People are trying to survive. We have come from a different culture. Try to understand our culture and where we've come mm. from and why we feel the way we feel. As a person, Dr. Brown, who's come out of homosexuality and traveled the country, do you know how I feel left out sometimes? I think about all these big speakers out there, and, and yes, I'm going to some churches, but sometimes I feel like because people know where I've come out of, they don't want to align themselves with me. That breaks my heart. It makes me feel like I am a second-class mm. citizen or you don't fit in to a, a certain group of people. I sit and I watch, and I'm a very good watcher, and I watch some of the conferences all over the country, and I watch the speakers that they have. I watch Donald Trump. I was in Washington, in, in New York, at the Trump 900 pastors and leaders were there. Me and a guy by the name of Greg Coinland, we were there. And the speakers that came out or the ones to get to ask questions, they were all white. No Hispanics. They were all white. And that should not happen. So you're going to have to mix it up so other voices can be heard. The other thing is that we're the African-American female. Trump has a faith advisory board. If you're going to bring people together, you're going to have to ha start having them on your team. Not less of them, but more of them. Where's the African-American woman on your faith-based team? We're going to have to come together, and that's where the racial divide is going to stop. Somebody like me who's come out of homosexuality, who's been abused, who's been raped, who's had an eating disorder, and God is now using my voice. These are the kind of people that you want to use because you want to get the information from us to find out what worked for us. Maybe it'll work for somebody else. Maybe not the same way, but it just might help some of these other young girls or some of these other young boys. We got to find a way to start using our voices, but using it in a correct way and not a bad way. I just feel like we're all just getting pushed back yeah. and we get the big one. I love T.D. Jakes. I love Jensen Franklin. These are big names. But a lot of times people go there and they think, yeah, what, you want another penny from us? You want this? I hear young kids talking. They might not say it in front of them, and I'm not saying that about them because I love them. I listen to them all the time. But this is what they're saying. Is it really about money? Is it really about us? I think there's a lot of confusion going on in the body of Christ. If we want kids and we want them in our churches, then let's start going to where they are and meeting their needs where they're at, not bring them to church if they're saying, hey, I'm hungry, give me some food. Let's clothe them, let's dress them. Let's meet their needs, and then in the end, they're going to see that you really care. And then I believe they're going to start coming to church. Yeah, Janet, in, in a few short minutes, you said a whole lot, and the challenges are there, and the question is how we respond. Janet, we just got started today. We're going to continue this conversation. I'm very glad you're part of my family. 